you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the 16 ghostly guilds in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the Proctor's Guild and their Embody Arconos. Hauntings and encounters with the restless dead have been portrayed in a number of ways across media. Don't ask me how many, for I quickly run out of fingers to count, and in my old age, that simple task becomes much more complicated than I would like. I have much more important things to be focusing my attention on right now, like teaching you the ways of our company and the true nature of these ghosts, or rather, the truth as we know it, which are significantly different things. But anyhow... Have you ever wondered how ghosts manifest into our world? What sort of gift do they use to appear before us? Clearly something most undead. Well, allow me to answer that question, my good explorer, promptly. That would be the Embody Arconos, developed and practiced by the Proctor's Guild. I suppose you would like a follow answer, yes? Well, sit back into the tombstone and allow me to further indulge you in the secrets of the Guild and their power. Embody allows one to manifest into the physical world, much like its namesake would define. In most cases, these are clearly most ghostly, like faint whispers that tickle the eardrums which float across the shroud. Many embody in forms that we would define as phantoms, a hazy, translucent figure that our brains recognize as the fake suggestion of a human body. But under the right circumstances, one can appear as their former mortal body, with only the most well-versed proctors, be it guildrave or not, can appear as if they were in life, fit with breathing, sweating, and blood should they undergo any harm. Otherwise, it is as patchy as the memory of themselves, which may be pretty hazy if said wraith is hundreds upon hundreds of years old. I see you are confused. Well, let me remind you of some wraith basics. Remember way back when we first started talking about wraiths, how we couldn't do much harm to them as ghosts. There are plenty around, especially here at the cemetery. We can't see them, of course, but let's say there is one somewhere mm, over there. If I were to open fire, kapow, with one of their battered pistols and shoot, the ghosts would still suffer damage to their corpus, their being, but not a great deal. Now, if they had manifested as a mortal, they would be wounded as if they were human. In addition, to the usual weaknesses, frightening stuff on all fronts. Obviously, such acts amongst wraiths are some of the most egregious of Charon's code, the dictum mortem. At least it does on paper, tablet, or whatever said rules are written on, if they are ever written down at all. The dealing with the quick, the mortals, in such an open and forward manner is, quite frankly, just too useful for wraiths. Only the most adherent of the hierarchy bootlickers felt to see the use of such a power. If anything, those with knowledge of Embody are in high demand. After all, that is why they exist in the Shadowlands. There is plenty of unfinished business to be had amongst all wraiths. Some can attune themselves to a specific person person so only they can see the ghost. I cannot remember if I have mentioned this before, but if I haven't, these mortals are referred to as consorts. While this makes it easier to work with certain members of the quick, the living person runs the risk of seemingly insane for talking nothing but thin air. The insanity of mortals is not the only thing embodied practitioners have to worry about. Strange things happen to those who misuse or fail a particular power within the Arconos. Some are frustrating and some quite serious. The two most serious are accidentally plunging themselves into the tempest while trying to materialize or gaining a large amount of angst when deprived of a serious experience in the Shadowlands. The process of performing the Arconos is far more than a disturbance of air. The ghost passes through two different worlds, which may as well be separate dimensions. One steps through a cold, numb wasteland to a much warmer and balmy climate. Seemingly superficial, but think for a moment what the wraith has to understand and process. They have to expose their fragile forms to intense levels of sensory input. Simple things like looking at oneself in the mirror or 
focusing on something hot or cold initially requires a lot of focus. These sensory stimuli serve as an anchor from across the shroud, drawing at their consciousness, which also resonates in the Shadowlands in its own way. The embodying wraith follows this resonance into the Skinlands. It is said that teachers and mentors teach the Arkonos in the most chaotic locations possible, as there is plenty of raw emotion to be had there. This, amongst all the other sensations surrounding it, makes Embody quite the difficult Arkonos to learn, and thus it is left to many preferring to commission embodied experts than learning the arts themselves, especially when it involves the quick. But how does one find such teachers? I am honestly not too sure, but I can tell you how to identify a proctor, or at least someone who is well versed in the Umbody Arkonos. As they continually cross the shroud, their bodies are marked with peculiar patches of light and dark. This is the most common of the Guildmark manifestations. Those who focus on more visual stimuli may have the other side of the shroud reflected in their eyes, whilst those that have a focus on temperature may have blisters or welts that reflect this. We also believe that if corpus loss while manifested forces the raven into a harrowing, the injury triggered by the harrowing often leaves a scar that even Moliate can't repair. There is no doubt in my mind that there are those who know the difference between ordinary scars and these embodied based ones. Many wear patterns on their skins which are said to be light dabbling through trees, according to our research that is. Like many of the guilds we have looked at, there is not a lot we know about their early histories. We know that the first race to master and develop the Embody Arkonos would form the Proctor's Guild can be dated back to the earliest days of the formation of the Shroud, or the Manifestation, if you would. You know several groups such as the Haunters, Spooks and Puppeteers tried approaching the interaction with the living world in different ways. The Proctors, or at least their forerunners, learned the means to subvert the Shroud through various sensations, extending across the shroud then manifesting in their own forms through the means we discussed earlier. And in case you were curious, many believe this is the point of the Outrage Arkonos as well. When business amongst the quick began to blossom, the early proctors saw this business model as an opportunity to monopolize the Embody Arkonos, making the guild one, if not the first guild, to take on the trappings of mortal trade associations and organize a body of monolithic service providers. You can see the interesting divide this probably caused. Many would be quite content with the business applications of this, whilst many would just wish to feel the fleshy pleasures again. Like a newer divergent and fuzzy drinks, there are few in the guild who hold a neutral stance regarding Embody. It wouldn't be long before the will of Charon would clamp down on Proctor activity, at least so they tried, for the guild would carry on regardless, resulting in the ironic development of legionnaires becoming well versed with Embody themselves, only to chase after these so called criminals. Perhaps it is the irony where the guild's name comes from. A Proctor is an officer, usually one or two, at certain universities appointed annually and having mainly disemparently functions. This, however, is just a theory and you are free to believe what you will and conduct your own research. It wouldn't surprise you to learn that the Proctors, after many centuries of insult and repression, were at the forefront of the War of the Guilds, also shaping a large portion of the blame for its failure. Many of the Guild's elders were sent to the forges and centurions were appointed to hunt down Proctors and enthrall them. We know that during the Great War, the Proctors explicitly sided with the Loyalist faction against the Neustigians and the Grim Legion. Their role in Grim Affairs were taken up by the Puppeteers for the duration. As a reminder, a Neustigian was a wraith of the hierarchy that supported the Smiling Lord and his Grim Legion during the Great War. They believed that the Smiling Lord's take charge and no-nonsense style was what Stygian needed to continue surviving. Especially as the previous Emperor, Charon had locked himself away in his Onyx Tower and seemed to care nothing for the affairs of the dead. 
As for today, these gloomy modern times, the Proctors still adorn the title of criminal guild, yes, but perhaps one with the tightest relationship with the hierarchy. Unlike the puppeteers and haunters, the Proctors generally don't have any motives beyond the Shroud. The guild's primary trade is focused in services performed across the Shroud, as it always has been, but they aim to set themselves apart through their ability to provide specialists, something they claim sets them apart from their lesser partners. Parties. They believe that the surest path to advancement within the guild is to able to apply a high demand skill set to the Skinlands objective. These are divided up into groups or factions. You have agents who meddle in mortal politics and business. The secretaries, as in keepers of secrets, provide the guild's intelligence tradecraft and sometimes can be convinced to use it on others' behalf. A rare few, and often short-lived, boojums make a trade of turning the tables on ghost hunters. Broctors who join the guild simply for personal gratification are tasters, which is either a mild insult or a badge of honour, depending on one's outlook on unlife. Finally, you have factors who coordinate the guild's commercial endeavours as well as its quietly maintained hierarchy relationships and provide most of the structure for the Proctor's overall organisation. It has taken quite a while for the Proctors to build some semblance of a positive relationship with the hierarchy, but the Proctors mainly wish to know what it's like to feel as they once did. They wish to experience life again, which may seem rather self-absorbed, but the Guild is fairly pacifistic about this. Consequently, the Proctors are largely tolerated by the hierarchy. If a Legion needs a shroud crossing job, and they do more often than they care to admit, the Proctors are a natural choice. Of course, that doesn't mean they are off scot free. They are still a criminal guild and do have a reputation, so don't exercise in body at any official, for the only thing you'll be embodying is a painfully hot soul forge. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.